Hi there, this is James Swanick, and you're listening to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast, where you learn how to take back control over alcohol and live a life of health, wealth, love, and happiness. So, welcome to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. This is Sarah Connolly, and I'm really excited today to have a very special and interesting guest joining us, an ex member of Project 90, who started the program five months ago. Neil is 41, he's based in Sydney, Australia, married with one son, and his journey is quite extraordinary. So I'm really happy to have Neil with us today, and I'm going to pass over to you, Neil, and ask if you would share a little bit about where you were before you joined Project 90. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, thanks for having me, Sarah. I think um, I was in... uh, uh, position before Project 90, I think a, a lot of people in my position find themselves in. Um, we had a, a business that's uh, only a couple of years old, and I found myself pretty uh, well stressed out just with life generally, uh, bringing up a family and starting a business and going with those challenges. And I found that, um, you know, I'd always, uh, part of, I suppose, my culture and the lifestyle I led was always to uh, eat and drink, to socialise. And whatnot, and over the last particularly maybe two years leading into me joining Project Ninety, I found that I the uh, the regularity of my drinking just increased and increased and increased, and uh, and the volume did a little bit as well. But um, I think it's that story of you know wine became just way too acceptable to have wine with dinner every day, and uh, I found then that I ended up needing wine to relax, or at least the perception that I needed something like that to relax after work, and so. It just got a little bit worse and worse, and I think I found that I wasn't necessarily handling the stresses of life really well, and I had the perception that wine was doing that for me. Um, so it um, it had started to impact my life on the day to day, and that I just found myself tired and sluggish and, and hard to get going. Um, but I, I think it'd be fair to say that I didn't have a massive problem like struggling to get out of bed each day or, or the like but um it had got to the point where it was impacting how i was feeling every day and i thought hey something has to um to change here yeah i think that's where i was and prior to this period of you know obviously i'm well, not obviously but many of us seem to notice that it escalates quite quickly when we notice it suddenly it starts to be a lot more prevalent and noticeable in our lives Prior to that, had you ever tried to stop drinking? Oh, most definitely, yeah. Um, well, many times, actually, depending on you know, different times in life, depending on age and circumstances. Um, but uh, the times where I'd stop drinking when I was younger would be things like where, um, you know, we, we had that sort of party scene um, going on. And culturally, I had a, a couple of sort of semi-corporate jobs and it was part of the culture to go out and party and whatnot after work and uh and also just uh, the lifestyle of friends and whatnot that we, we would go and do that with and so um what i what i found was I'd, I'd go through these sort of health kicks you know like oh it's a monday on monday i'm gonna look after myself on monday i'm gonna stop eating carbs and therefore i cannot drink and so on and so forth and i think um you know i was a pretty good drinker i was good at it i could party for days and go to work and all of those sorts of things um, and because of that, I found that I could always drink to excess and then there would be periods of time where I'd try and stop that altogether thinking it was an all or nothing type of, uh, type of mindset. And so the, uh, the long or, or the short answer to your question is many times I tried to stop drinking, um, but none with the sort of passion that I have this time around. I think this time around, I, I saw it differently. I, I saw it as, uh, A, I have a family now that I'm, you know, didn't have when I was younger, um, but B, I started to realise actually this is impacting my health and how I feel and my ability to operate each day as opposed to oh, I've been partying too much and I want to look better or, or feel better. Yeah. So it was a really big difference, yeah. So you came across uh, this program and mm. what happened then? You obviously signed up for a call. I imagine you researched other options as well. Yeah, so actually, I think uh, it's a really um, good 
discussion to have because what I found quite disappointing, really, um, but also just challenging, but also really disappointing is that there aren't actually a lot of options that suit mm -hmm. people. Um, I'll say our circumstances because as I've gone through Project 90, I've realised there's a lot of people in a very similar situation to myself. And, and our circumstances means that people that are functioning really well, um, that see their own drinking as problematic for them, but maybe the rest of society don't necessarily see it that way. And so didn't uh, and still don't fit the mould of what a, someone that has a problem with alcohol might look like. And so... I think if you have what is perceived to be a problem, you can get help. And that looks like AA style programs or, um, you know, uh, sort of in-house programs where you, you know, locked up for a week or two or those sorts of things. And that wasn't the help that I was after. Mm. Uh, and I don't and didn't identify as having that sort of problem. Um, I'm cautious to say that level of problem because I think, your problem is associated with how you think and feel about it. I don't know if the labels or what other people put on it is really that necessary. Um, but I couldn't be termed as a, a, an alcoholic in my mind, but at the same time, I was like, well, alcohol is affecting my life. I want some help, but more than anything, I want a bit of education because I'm sure I can stop something for a short period of time, but why do I always end up back drinking or partying or living this life? And how can I understand it more so as I can have the, the choice of really um, controlling it at that time. So it's very interesting, Sarah, I'm not drinking at all at the moment and can't see myself drinking again in the foreseeable future, which is pretty odd to say, but that's not how I went into this. I went into this looking for how can I get real control over my drinking? So I only drink one day a week or something that I had a magical number I'd come up with that would make it all be comfortable and acceptable. And I just couldn't find that sort of help. The closest thing I found was a program. Um, I live in Sydney in, in the inner West and it was a program about five minutes from my house. Um, but I'd have to go and stay there for a week, five minutes up the road. And I thought, wow, how drastic is that? And what message is that sending to my child that I could leave him for a week? um because you know dad drinks too much wine like how yeah, horrible that just really didn't sit with me um so i searched for something else and that searching sarah looked like hours on the couch on my phone googling every possible combination of thing um only to find some sort of in-house program or aa or something with a religious um belief and that just didn't really work or uh, uh, i couldn't associate with yeah yeah and I think it's a very common dilemma for what we would call grey area drinkers, um, which is, you know, they don't identify as being that rock bottom stereotypical uh, alcoholic, which is a word that we don't really like very much because mm. there's no diagnosis, um, but that need support. And as you say, it's not a matter of not knowing how to stop drinking it's more a matter of how do I stay quit? Um, yeah. yeah. And you know, uh, the labeling of something as uh, alcoholic, there was a couple of concerns to me there. One was I didn't want to steal or label myself, you know, and steal a title from other people that I had this perception of, well, they have this real problem. I can't steal their title because that's not me. Let's not be um, too dramatic. But alcohol was affecting me me so I knew I needed help but um so I didn't want to um, label myself as that um, because I didn't think that that's exactly who I was but also I had a fear with labeling myself as having a problem with drinking um because there's no doubt my uh, grandfather was an alcoholic and that alcohol was a bit of a problem with some of my family members um my extended family I should say and maybe they wouldn't like to hear that but I, I think that culturally um there's a bit of a problem with alcohol in our family and so I felt really uncomfortable labelling myself or other people as alcoholics. The word just didn't really resonate, you know, comfortably. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally get that. So you joined Project 90 about five months ago and you had quite an extraordinary time, especially in the early months. Would you be <clears throat> to share how that played out for you? 
Yeah, so actually leading into Project 90, I think um, really quite lucky. Um, I had, I can't remember the exact detail, but I kind of kicked off and had a call with people at Project 90 on a Thursday, Friday, and said, cool, we'll kick off on the Sunday or Monday. And a couple of things happened. Uh, it must have been a Monday. Um, firstly, that day, I went out for dinner and drank uh, equally as much wine as I would have any other day, even though I'd committed to starting a program. Um, and then I had, actually it must have been a Wednesday, because I specifically then remember on a Thursday, I had a corporate um, sort of dinner with the chairman of our group and uh, a new potential partner. We went to a restaurant um, up the road here and I'd said, hey, I'm, um, I had the option to drink in my mind because I hadn't started the program as of yet, but I decided just naturally I didn't want to drink that day. So I made this excuse like, oh, it's a Thursday. Uh, I'll just have a non-alcoholic beer and a water today, guys, and made a little bit of a joke about it. Um, I don't regret it, but it was an unnecessary uh, joke. No one really gave a shit. That I, I thought that everybody cared that I wouldn't be drinking. Um, but that was more around, I suppose, my persona. And uh, so I chose not to drink that day. Um, and then the weekend uh, came and naturally I just didn't drink before starting the, the program. Um, but then I, uh, I went into the program for a few days and then went down to my family's um, uh, property down in the Southern Highlands. My, my, um, yeah, my parents were moving house. My mum was overseas, actually. My dad was here. My parents were moving house. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've been down to the Southern Highlands in New South Wales, Sarah, but it's in, in Barrel specifically. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's really nice. And uh, one thing about Barrel is uh, lots of great cafes and restaurants and shopping. It's very beautiful and it's uh, it's cold. And so um, really conducive to getting a fire going and drinking wine. And that's what we did there. My youngest brother lives down there as well. And um, so I had gone down and helped my dad move into the, the new property, which is actually a little old house. And as I did that, um, it was the first sort of weekend I went down there where I wasn't drinking at all. And I found that bit quite easy. Um, I had just decided I was on this journey and uh, I had found it quite easy. Um, but as I, as I went through uh, that weekend, a few things happened. It was helping my, my father move um, furniture and, and I kept getting these crazy uh, headaches. And the headaches were uh, that feeling like my head was literally going to explode. And, um, it's quite hard to explain because it, it literally, I think that's probably the best explanation. But um, every time I lifted something or did, did something strenuous, um, the pain was really quite unbearable. And I kept it to myself. Um, and one of the things <laughs> that I had, I feel a bit guilty about saying this, but I was thinking to myself, geez, dad's getting on my nerves this weekend. I keep getting these bloody stressed out headaches whenever he's saying anything and blah, blah, blah. But all Dad was saying was, oh, can you lift that couch with me? Can you move this? Can you do that? And the reality was that there was something wrong in my in my brain. And uh, I was unaware of that. But I, I went home and a couple of days later, the pain just kept coming and getting worse and worse and worse. And what I, uh, what I realised that there was something really wrong, went to a doctor and they gave me some um, drugs and said, we'll do some tests and so on and so forth. Uh, a day or so later the pain became that unbearable that i just went and got a scan um on my my brain and within 10 minutes into the scan a doctor came in and said mate you need to go to emergency you've got a, a tumor and a cyst and a brain aneurysm all going at the one spot uh, which um yeah It's uh, it was pretty scary, and um, yeah, I think uh, you know, obviously I'm getting emotional about it now. It's something to that's not easy to deal with. Um, but I think there's two things, three things I'm really quite lucky for. But firstly, 
I think if I had been drinking that weekend, like I normally would when I went down there, because that's when I I'd kind of drink a lot because you're away for the weekend and you perceive that you're wanting to have this fun or whatnot. Um, I probably would have thought, geez, you got a bad hangover this week mm. and uh, might not have got tested as much. Um, and then, you know, the other thing to be, um, you know, to be grateful for is just your intuition to know mm. there's something wrong. And I think that intuition, that's what led me to find some assistance. I think, I genuinely believe that my mind and body knew there's something not quite right with you. Go and get mm. some help. And because I got that help, I was then in a position to be able to, you know, then go and pursue the extra assistance. And that help I'm referring to was going and finding help with alcohol with P90. So as I then had the clarity to know, well, hey, it's not a hangover, go get mm. checked and then go into hospital. Um, but the third thing to be grateful for is that uh, within a few days, um, the great hospital system we have here in Australia had me in surgery and all my problems majorly resolved. Um, I mean, I was in hospital last week a couple of times with some you know, extra headaches and things that are residual things that are stuck around, but 90% of my health is fixed. And so I don't want to be too dramatic, but I'm already a bit upset anyway. Um, but I think this saved my life. Yep. Extraordinary. Thank you for sharing that because it's obviously, I mean, I have goosebumps over this side of the screen, um, but I, I do feel that what you're saying is so pertinent that had you not made this decision and had you not had that clarity, it's quite possible that you would have put at least put things off perhaps. Yeah. And some of the things you learn, Sarah, I had a, um, I knew nothing about this stuff and I still really don't, but I had a, a tumour and a cyst and a brain aneurysm, which I don't think many people get the trifecta, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, and the real challenging one is the aneurysm because I think that can clot and then literally you can die. And it's probably, if it was untreated, it probably would have been like a 50, 50 sort of scenario over the next year, 18 months or something and the like. And uh, so it's amazing to think you can catch something like that. Yeah. And not know about it. I mean, they, they just are, are very hard to detect, especially the aneurysm, aneurysm on its own. And interestingly, um, one of the things I found out is that it's highly likely that uh, I'll get it wrong. It's either the cyst or the tumour, I'm not quite sure. Um, I would have had since birth um, right. and just had never been detected. So 40-odd years of kicking around with this thing going on in your brain. I wonder mm. I was a bit nuts. Yeah, okay. makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> so you... You had that experience quite early on in Project 90 and there, and so I know that there were times when you weren't able to, to make the sessions, et cetera. Mm. When you were ready to come back in, tell us a bit about that experience. Yeah, well, um, actually, I, um, I didn't think too much about Project 90 for a, a little period of time. Um, there's a video that I have, which I sent to the Project 90 um, group. And it was me standing outside the hospital as I was going through the process. And it was really, really difficult um, to rewatch that video a couple of times. I can, whilst I'm getting upset now, I can see looking back at that, what a state I was in. Um, and then uh, as, uh, as I went through surgery and whatnot, actually, within a couple of hours, I had extreme clarity on, like, just what was important. Um, the business that I'm involved in, uh, still a high priority to me today, but for a couple of weeks, it just kind of went out of my mind. And all I could care about was getting my health back on track. And whilst I didn't think specifically of Project 90, 
I was just really glad that I had made the decision to stop drinking alcohol um, for that period. Uh, and then I, I wanted to, I had a, a few weeks of challenging recovery where um, about four weeks where I was at home quite a lot um, and needed some help. And uh, it was only a few weeks but I had decided um, that it was really disappointing that I'd missed out perhaps on four weeks of learning with the Project 90 group and that I had sort of 12 weeks earmarked and then thereafter, whilst I was going to continue into the Beyond program, I hadn't really thought past the 12 weeks. I had it quite clear in my mind that for that 12 weeks, I would stop drinking, get the control that I wanted and then potentially would drink again. Um, but I had realised that, hey, you're all focused on getting better, but you've missed out on four weeks of this program. And this program potentially saved your life. Um, what haven't you learned? What have you missed? And so I actually um, contacted um, Victoria and had said, how do I best transition back into the group? Um, do I share the info? Which um, most definitely agreed we would because we'd started to do that. And I don't know if I'm confident enough just to start talking to everybody again. I can only make a call or so a week just because of the time zone. So what do we do? And Victoria was awesome. She um, said, hey, well, if you really want to go through that, that learning and be part of the group for a while, let's just extend your journey with us by another month and jump back in. And uh, I went back in then for the next eight weeks. Um, just to clarify, this was uh, only a couple of weeks into the journey. Um, when all this happened. So I went back in for the next eight or nine weeks, something of the like. Um, but I went in with a huge commitment and the huge commitment was just like I do with work. I knew that I didn't have the best skills or all the knowledge yet or whatever else, but I could just turn up for whatever calls were available in my time zone. And the one thing that was really in my control was to jump on to the polos and communicate with the group each day and share my learnings and share how I was feeling and that that would be my contribution to the group. Um, I think you've heard us kind of, you know, speak about this in the past and we, we joke about how great Australian men are at communicating and sharing our emotions <laughs> and some of those things. We can't shut you guys up when it comes to emotions. <laughs> <laughs> but you, do you know what? You probably could say that about me now. Mm. Um, I think there's been a huge turnaround in how I communicate. Mm. Um, before, I always wanted to communicate well for particular outcomes, i.e. I wanted to, you know, get an outcome with a customer or whatever else that was very specific. Um, whereas with this group, what I realised was that um, the American guys share really well, uh, you might say too well, um, and we probably didn't. And I just said to myself, well, hey, what I'm going to do is try and find the middle ground between how we act and how they act and God, wouldn't it be great to be somewhere in the in the middle there? And I think what's actually happened is that I've ended up like a lot of the American guys and just really been able to share um, my feelings. But what I chose to do was share as many learnings as possible and hope that other people would share their learnings in return. And that has definitely uh, definitely happened, and to my benefit. Yeah, and and to everybody else's, not you know, having been in the program with you, you were such a you know it's so involved um when you could be and so my question is um because one of the challenges as you mentioned at the beginning is relatability of programs when you came into project 90 how would you describe your relationships with the other members um at the start i actually found quite challenging if if i'm honest um, I, I didn't know if I identified with everybody and it wasn't easy to see, like not everybody looks and feels exactly the same, but what became apparent really quickly is that everyone was a high performer of some sort. And so whilst we all look different and are in different industries and some people, are, you know, the stay at home mother in the, um, who's still in the P90 group that I could really relate to. Um, and we're living polar opposite lives in that, in that sense. But um, 
you know, she's a lady of high integrity and that performs really well in her life. And that's where the, um, I think that's where the relationships are built is in understanding that, hey, we're all intending on living pretty good lives and are high performers. And over time, um, there are other people in the program um, that I won't name um, for their own privacy, and, um, but whereby their businesses kind of look, the industry might be different, but they're in similar situations to us. And the other thing that the other type of person in the group that um, I really enjoyed was those that were achieving more than me in their business life. Um, and I haven't been able, due to the time zone, to get onto a lot of the, um, the calls specifically related to business, but I did end up having a lot of one-on-one -on -one calls with the business people. Uh, in, in my instance, actually, most of them um, were, were men um, that had a lot of success that I could then ask questions of them. How did you, when you were growing your business and you had this challenge like I do, what did that look like? Or uh, The other thing that just happens with those sorts of people is it's just aspirational. They just mm. spurt me on a little bit to think a bit more. And when you look at the program, um, one of the pillars of the, the program is all around um, what we gain. And I think when I look at all of the people mm. and how I started to look at those people and what I started to look for, I started to look for what can I gain out of all of these relationships? Mm. Um, I just put the, the learning mindset on as opposed to what can I financially gain? It's just what can I learn from these people? Um, and I've learned a lot about mindset and business from those people without even asking a lot of specific questions, just watching and learning. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, Neil, you came through the program. You made some um, incredible discoveries personally professionally as well, it sounds like. Um, how did you feel towards the end of the program? How do you, what do you feel were the most significant differences that you noticed in your life? Um, well, I think the main thing should be really focused on what matters most, which is you know, in this house that I'm living in, you've got Liz and Benji, my wife and, uh, and my son. And I think I probably was unaware of the impact that I was having on Liz with the sort of life that I was leading. Um, and that doesn't just relate to um, my alcohol use because how I was using, using alcohol was just as a bit of a Band-Aid for how I was living. Um, but just always feeling uh, stressed or pressure or living too much on the edge, I think, was just impacting how Liz was feeling and, and, and you know, her, perhaps her confidence. And I was probably showing her that she wasn't my number one priority in life, even though I thought that my family was. I think some of my actions probably weren't uh, in line with, with that value that I thought I had. Um, and so our relationship probably wasn't at its finest level. And when I, I look back um, at the years, you know, when we got married and so on and so forth, we had always got on really well and we were in some really, really great phases of life. Um, but in those last couple of years, we probably weren't in the best phase of, of life in terms of um, how I was acting. And I think I only realised towards the end of the program that it was majorly my actions that had impacted how we were feeling. The, uh, the lucky side of things is that uh, when you love somebody and they love you so much, as soon as you change the way you act, they adjust how they feel naturally and the feeling of safety came back into our relationship really, really, really quickly. And uh, yeah. then getting sick, I think Liz and I have never been tighter, so it's a real benefit. Um, the other thing I think that was just so obvious was how Benji became a priority in my life. Um, in terms of I was able to get up early with him but wanted to get up early, wanted to take him to his little daycare and wanted to spend that time getting a coffee together on the way and just talking and chatting and thinking about him. And uh, I think he's gained Take your time.
he's got his dad back. Yeah. It's it's pretty profound, isn't it? Mm. When you look, when when you really see what an impact stopping drinking has, mm. you start to realise what an impact it had. Yeah, I didn't think it was having that sort of impact on my family. That's for sure. And again, uh, it's not to play it down, Sarah, but. I wasn't drinking a bottle of vodka on the couch every night or those sorts of things. And I think uh, what happened when I removed something um, like alcohol from my life was that I just allowed all these other things just to come back in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there's no doubt that um, removing the alcohol was the catalyst for it all. But what it actually kicked off in me was just a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And it was a, what do I care about? And it got me focused. Mm. yeah mm. incredible so five months alcohol free now and what's life been like for you since you finished your 90 days um it's different because the learning curve i suppose you know on a different part of the curve um I learned, uh, I was educated quite a lot around the science of uh, of drinking and, you know, got my understanding and there was so much learning that happened in the Project 90 program. Um, and you think to yourself, well, hey, what can you learn? It's just drinking. Well, there was so much I just learned about my personality and types of addiction and how I act and how I respond and uh, even things that I thought I was quite well educated in around understanding my values and certain things like that. Um, so that learning curve was so great that it was really easy to see uh, all the progress in Project 90. Whereas now that I've been out and I'm in um, the Beyond program and I uh, catch up, I think, probably about once a week at the moment with everybody, I found it to be quite different. Uh, but in a little bit of a lull, uh, if I'm honest. Um, where there's not as much learning and now it's um, more, hey, well, this is a new way of living and I'm just going through the motions. And um, I suppose the one thing that's really, really strong in my mind is that I can't see a time where I'd want to drink again, um, which is amazing. Um, but the other thing that's um, really interesting is that there's no more sort of amazing changes. There's not this great feeling of, oh, I wake up feeling amazing every day now and I can't wait to go. And, like, I think if if that's what I was looking for, I might be disappointed because that would also not be living real life. Mm. And removing alcohol meant that I've had to deal with just reality in its purest form and just, well, this is what it is. And that's where I'm at now, that I'm just going through the motions, but I'm stronger, I'm calmer, and I've got my family. But there is no magic bullet here that's going to make you feel amazing uh, every day. And so I think there's a long way of saying I'm a little bit bored. <laughs> I think it's just like, <laughs> yeah. Lucky I've got all these other problems in life like everybody else, you know, a, a startup business and normal family problems and whatever else. But in this space, it's just like, right, now I'm learning how just to live and, you know, I'm lucky I've got a positive mindset anyway and I'm ready to get up and go each day. But, uh, you know, I'm not uh, waking up feeling like, oh, my world's completely changed. I'm amazed and happy. So mm -hmm. I've got to disappoint anyone with that, with that answer, <laughs> but it's reality. Yeah, and, and it certainly plays out differently for different people. Um, I think depending on so many factors, but the reality is, as we, you know, as you've talked about, when we stop drinking we're just living in reality and reality has all the highs and lows that life has when we're drinking mm. um but they're just not as extreme right <laughs> absolutely yeah which how nice is that right because it's it's funny because you can like celebrate or commiserate um with drinking if you're that way inclined mm. you can use it in both and uh 
you know, no one wants to see anybody too happy, right? We all get a little bit, you know, skeptical or maybe jealous or think, what's wrong with that person? And equally, you know, no one wants to sit in a restaurant or a pub with somebody crying into their glass of wine, right? So mm-hmm. um, having life sort of, you know, a bit more even keel is quite a comfortable place to be. Well, it's not that exciting. It's uh, it's nice to be in that spot. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and overall, actually, Sarah, there's this sort of air of everything will be okay. Mm. It's just kind of sitting in my back of my mind now that I know I love it. Everything works out pretty much. Yeah, I think that's really, really important for people to hear because Mm. that's actually a significant mind shift from what most people live in, which is fear or fear Mm. of this and anxiety about that and how's this going to work out, etc. And that's that fear kind of fuels the drinking to escape the fear, but it's that cycle. And when alcohol is removed, and I see this so often with people, it's like there's this underlying sense of calm that no matter what, I can deal with it. And I don't need to down a glass of wine in order to do that. Well, you know, the um, Sarah, the, the business that um, I'm involved in, I'm uh, lucky that um, I'm one of the leaders in our little group. Um, but with that comes a whole host of pressure. Mm. And... Uh, you know, responsibility and, and stress. And so you have to be thankful for that because it means you're in a pretty good position in life, um, that you're having a go and that people believe in you and you're supported to have a go. But um, some of the challenges and pressures that we've been facing over the last, even the last few weeks, um, I have had to ask myself, uh, do you think you'd be able to handle this level of stress and pressure if you were living the way you were living before? Um, or if you hadn't had this big life challenge to, you know, challenge you in terms of your health, would you know deep down that everything will be okay? And I actually believe I probably would have had to give up what I'm doing at the moment if I was still living the lifestyle I was living before because I wouldn't have been strong enough. Um, and so I'm grateful for that as well, for sure, to, to know that uh, you can do it and there's not a bunch of band-aids here in, in the forms of uh, bottles of wine um, trying to cover everything up. Yeah, it's it's incredibly, um, what's the word, validating, I think, when you know yourself that you've been capable of overcoming such a significant challenge. And as you say, it doesn't mean you have to be drinking a bottle of vodka a night, but mm. to remove something that is so prevalent everywhere and is so ingrained in our culture to have the courage and strength to do that gives you a real sense of inner strength and trust, right? Yeah, and um, although importantly, um, I clearly know that it doesn't mean that I'm going to have success either with the business or in life or any of those things, not guaranteed, um, but everything will be okay um, mm. none, nonetheless. And so, yeah, but, uh, I mean, it's, again, you don't want to disappoint people, but it's not a guarantee that everything's going to, you know, work out just because I have uh, chosen to become calmer and I've chosen to give up something that was making me anxious. And um, I think that's, uh, yeah, probably don't want to be too far off topic, but I, I think um, off the current topic at least, but that's one of those misconceptions that I know you know too well because you were one of the people that taught me, but uh, is that misconception that alcohol helps you calm in anxious situations and wow why did it take me so long to realize that actually removing alcohol will give me more calm than adding it it's just fuel to the fire like uh, you know i do other things that probably make me a bit more anxious like i, I drink three or four coffees a day now and I'll, i'm even considering maybe removing some of those because i've realized that one of the keys to success is not what you add in it's what you take away um which is huge yeah yeah, that's a really, really deep realisation. Mm. One that you can apply to pretty much everything from now on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Less is more. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, absolutely. Who knew? Yeah. Um, so, Neil, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, before we finish the this recording, is there anything that, else that you'd like to share or 
add to what you've told us, shared with us so far? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that if you're in position, uh, and I'll speak to males because I am one, and it's the only perspective I have, um, but if you're embarrassed or if your ego is getting in the way of you getting some assistance or doing some learning or whatever else, just remove it. Like I think the embarrassment, the ego and wanting to work things out for myself stopped me ever seeking help in, in this area. And if I had have come into this program and not taken the walls down and leaned Hi. into sharing, like I mentioned earlier with, um, you know, the way a lot of the American guys do and whatnot, I would never got all of this out of the program. And so I think, yeah, to any other guys, just, hey, my encouragement is to remove your ego and or embarrassment and mm -hmm. try and learn a little. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, Neil. Um, it's an incredible story, very inspirational. And what I really love is that you've been very real as well um, and told it how it is. <laughs> and what I also get from it is the Aussie, she'll be right, mate. <laughs> totally. It doesn't work. <laughs> the, um, and thanks as well, Tara. I know I sent you a, a note um, separately a week or so ago, but, um, you know, you've got to thank people like yourself that are out there helping us and learning and teaching us all. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate all the support. Oh, well, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Sarah Connolly for the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. Thanks for joining us. See you next month. Hi, this is James Swanick, and we're taking applications for our 90 day and one year stop drinking programs. Clients are mostly executives, entrepreneurs, and investors who have tried unsuccessfully and repeatedly to stop drinking but remain stuck in a frustrating cycle of stop start, stop start. Our programs are not AA, which has a reported 7% success rate. Our programs are not rehab, which has a reported 6% success rate. Our 90 day and one year programs involve a safe, fun, virtual community of high achievers with a process that boasts an incredible 92% success rate of clients reaching at least 90 consecutive days alcohol free. We use the latest neuroscience and personal development processes to help rewire clients' brains around alcohol and minimize its importance in their lives. We will show you how to powerfully socialize with friends, family, and colleagues, what to say and how to say it so people don't mistakenly think that you're an alcoholic or have a problem, and how to eliminate the temptation of returning to constant drinking so you can finally break the stop-start cycle. To ensure client success, Project 90 can only accept 15 new clients each month. Some of those happy clients include John Keltner from California who said, I've lost 10 pounds. Susie Vaughan, a real estate broker in Tennessee who said, I've generated 20% more leads. Jessica Gaines Jarbo from Kentucky who says, I've now got joy, focus, presence, and clarity. And Joe Worley from Michigan who says, my wife has the real Joe back. If you're an executive, entrepreneur, or investor who's sick of the stop-start cycle and the damaging effects alcohol has on your health, happiness, and family, and you're ready to regain confidence, become more present with your spouse and children, reduce stress, anxiety, and irritability, sleep better, increase focus and productivity, and feel better quickly, you're invited to apply to become a Project 90 client. Applicants can apply for an introductory interview by visiting alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash project90. There's a link in the show notes, which you can just click, but that link is alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash project90.